A huge host of new Chaos Demons leaks today. We've got some cool details on several more units, most of the god-specific Warp Storm abilities, and a whole load of leaks points from the Codex, so let's talk about Chaos Demons and how they're going to be shaping up. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where it seems that Codex Chaos Demons is going to be dropping for Warhammer 40k on this Saturday. That's when it will be going up for pre-order, and we should be able to get our hands on most of the juicy details for the rules. I'll certainly be reviewing the book on the channel. It's going to be interesting to see what sort of threats the Warp Spawn are going to be able to deliver. I must admit though, at the moment with 40k having at least a reasonable semblance of balance, I do wonder whether Games Workshop is going to be able to keep that going releasing a book for a faction that's often been kind of tricky to balance in the past. I feel that at least most of the time over 40k's past, Chaos Demons have generally tended to be either on the very strong side or the very weak side, without all that much in between. They certainly felt fairly brutal to play against in 5th edition, and while their performance has been fairly forgettable throughout most of 9th, in 8th edition they had times when they were just dominating the table with 180 plague bearers and gumming up the entire board. I think perhaps they might be one of the trickier factions to balance in general for 40k. They operate very differently to many of the other races in the game, basically being defended by their inball saves or these new demon saves. Plus they're very very melee orientated and often tend to have deep strike tricks going on. Maybe a little bit of a skew faction, things like knights or tau. In this new codex, the new demon inball saves certainly look rather scary. They've got different powers at range and in melee and it could create some weird interactions. Particularly say if you're playing a Zinch list against a ranged army, that sounds like it could be an uphill struggle. It does feel just a little bit on the power creepy side as well, as these new demon saves are going to be usable against things that will typically ignore invuls, things like say Bellacor's sword, the Nightbringer's attacks, the Tau railgun, death hex and more. From the playtester leaks, it sounds like they're at least somewhat concerned that they might be one of the strongest codexes in the game so far. Apparently the codex was planned around certain limitations, such as one greater demon per detachment, and then apparently they scrapped that rule, seeing as it didn't seem very popular when it was floated to the community. So if they are an awesome bundle of synergy and power, that could be something to be concerned about. Combined with a standard 9th edition power boost, it might well be too much, particularly as I think that balance in 9th edition could be kind of easily upset. At the moment, at least the vast majority of armies in the game do have a chance at challenging for top spots, even if there are still some that are significantly better than others. Just the one army above the power curve could well make a lot of armies feel significantly more underwhelming. Hopefully Games Workshop manages to keep it together. The last three codexes have been pleasingly strong but not overpowered. They managed to release both of the Knight codexes, which are basically skew factions in themselves, and they were both strong but not too strong. So fingers crossed they can keep it up for demons. In any case though, today we've got a massive amount of demon leaks. Over the past few weeks, there's been a trio of leakers that have been sharing things on Discord and YouTube. They had an early copy of the Playtest Codex, and also a few details from the revised one apparently. Mr. Wallace, Corkin and Trout have been sharing a whole bunch of fun stuff. A lot of the leaks today come from a Q&A session that they've been doing on Discord. Mr. Corkin answering a bunch of questions via an online submission form. Today I thought we'd do a bit of a roundup of the major themes of those, and obviously still at this point until we see it in print from Games Workshop. This is still just a little bit on the speculative side, though broadly their leaks have been pretty accurate so far. In general, there's a bunch of major themes from the Codex. Of course we know about those demon saves, usually tending to be a 4 plus at range and 5 plus in combat. Characters are often a 4 plus at both, and Zinch seems to be the skewed one with a 3 plus against range and a 6 plus in combat. Potentially going to be hard to kill for armies like Tau, but easy to kill for melee based ones. We've also got that Warp Storm table for various different army-wide buffs depending on some rolls. We'll get onto that in a second as there's plenty more leaks rules for it. They've rumoured that demons are going to be able to ally pretty easily with things like Chaos Space Marines and other armies, taking a small detachment of demons that's less than 500 points and not breaking army-wide special rules. That would be really cool, hopefully they have kept it in the codex as I'm sure that would please a lot of Chaos players. From Games Workshop's contents page for the book, it seems that the book's split into five main sections. First an intro section, introducing things like Invuls and the Warp Storm. Then one section for each one of the gods, with their own relics, warlord traits and stratagems separately, plus exalted greater demon traits. Then there's a Chaos Undivided type one, where there's Belacor and the unaligned things like Demon Princes and Soul Grinders, plus some rules for the Disciples of Belacor Army of Renown. It does seem for the most part it's going to be operating as four mini-armies, 
Outside of the disciples of Bellacor, it doesn't look like there's any undivided stratagems or things, or any undivided relics or warlord traits. Data sheets wise apparently it's broadly going to be the same. There's plenty of data sheets that are going to be consolidated into the book, such as Bellacor who came out in one of those Warzone books, plus a bunch of Slanesh updated data sheets. The HQ section looks like it's still going to be remaining very bloated. Apparently no data sheets have been moved to elites or anything, which is a bit of a shame. About half the Demon Codex is made up of HQ choices, and it does seem a bit excessive. Chaos Furies are confirmed to be gone. Kind of sad thing as they had some quite nice undivided Fury models for Warcry. It would have been nice to use those for 40k. Apparently there's one new data sheet for the book in the Skull Altar. I believe that one has some rules in one of the Visualist expansions a while back. It looks like Corn will be getting a fortification in the proper codex. Otherwise, the Bloodthirster datasheets have been merged into one. Kind of makes sense, as they're basically different war gear options more than anything else. And those Slanesh Demon twins, Sinessa and Dexessa, aren't making their way into the codex. A few people corrected me in my previous video. They're not really greater demons of Slanesh, but more sort of fragments of Slanesh back from the Age of Sigmar world. Still, though, I think it's a bit of a shame. They're really quite cool demon models for Slanesh. I think that they could have written themselves an excuse to include them in the 41st millennium as well. Would have been nice for people who wanted those models. For relics and warlord traits, each god will have their own table. And apparently, weirdly, each god will have its own extra relic stratagem, meaning that you could have an absolute ton of relics in a demon army. Though weirdly, apparently there's no individual warlord traits for any of the different gods. So I guess you'd just be limited to the one warlord trait from the table and no more. Kind of weird that if it does turn out to be true. It'd be pretty different to how most of the other factions in the game function. Finally, supposedly all troops are 10 model units now. They seem to think that that's the case for everything, including demonettes. Apparently the theme for the lesser demons is that they're far more valuable in terms of points, but the squad size is now capped. From the other leaks, it really does sound like their damage, durability and points costs have all increased by quite big amounts. Still seems a bit weird for basically horde units to suddenly turn into individual 10 man units though. I can't imagine that that will please many people who have a load of copies of the same lesser demons. Next up, if we focus on the Warp Storm, there's been a bunch of new traits leaks for it. This one's the Pure Demons Army Wide Special Rule. GW confirmed this in a preview article, basically rolling 8d6 for every point on that star, and every 4 plus that you get gains you a Warp Storm point, which you can spend on whole army abilities for each of the gods. There's going to be 8 different generic ones that apply to all chaos and then three god-specific ones for each one of the deities, those latter ones obviously only affecting chunks of your army. There do seem to be some other ways to generate warp storm points, such as Epidemius for Nurgle, and some of the leakers said that there's going to be some sort of mechanic for rolling less dice if you bring more chaos deities to the table, basically a trade-off and reward for taking more units and having more options along, but your army-wide rule gets a bit weaker. This is a leaked list of a fair few of the warp storm abilities, it isn't complete, we're missing a bunch of the universal ones, one of the corn ones, and some of the warp storm point values for the zinch ones, but it is quite interesting. The universal ones are the ones that DW revealed, a minus one to hit outside 12 inches for all demons, and one way to mess with enemy strategic reserves. I think that the minus one to hit one is well worth it earlier in the game, that could really annoy some big shooting armies, guard commanders would not thank you for that. For corn, there's a full warp storm point one for plus one attack, Pretty handy, and direct damage increases usually work well. Could be very nice with a strength 5, AP 3, and damage to Bloodletter Hellblades. And then there's a 3 Warp Storm point 1 for units not being able to fall back from them on a 4+. plus. I did wonder whether or not that would be a Slanesh one potentially, but it seems that Corn just makes enemies so angry that they have to stay in combat. That one could be quite big if you've locked up multiple enemy ranged units, and you don't want to have them getting away. For Slanesh, they have a 4 Warp Storm point 1 to fight first, Sometimes that's relevant, sometimes less so. Does imply that they won't be getting it on their base data slates anymore though. There's a 3 Warp Storm point 1 for plus 1 to advance and charge. That's used in the command phase and would make them a lot faster. Could give you some 8 inch charges out of Deep Strike if you were liked. And then there's a 2 Warp Storm point 1 that you use at the start of your opponent's turn. Enemy units within 12 inches of Slanesh units have to roll a 2d6 when they do actions. If it's greater than their leadership then they can't do said action. I guess it's quite cheap. Does feel pretty niche though. Might struggle to be worth the investment unless you're playing a very specific army, say a low leadership army like Orcs who've chosen some secondaries that need to do actions. Next there's 3 for Nurgle. 2 Warp Storm points for enemy units within 12 inches taking D3 mortal wounds on a 6. 
kind of fun that it's direct damage, but you have to have an awful lot of enemy units within that 12-inch range for that to be worth it, I think. In reality, I can't really see that being played all that much, maybe as a filler to use up Warp Storm points that you have spare. There's another two Warp Storm point, one for plus one AP when you're targeting vehicles in melee, maybe some sort of Touch of Rust type ability. Could be a handy one to remember if you're fighting knights, maybe. And then finally, there's a big four Warp Storm point, one for plus one to hit in melee for all Nurgle units. Another very solid one, maybe not quite as strong as the plus one attack for Korn, maybe. But still, as Chaos Demons are largely a melee army, that's not going to hurt if you're playing all Nurgle. Finally, there's three Zinch ones mentioned, a three Warp Storm point, one for plus one to cast, and then two more that Mr. Corkin didn't confirm the Warp Storm point levels on. An interesting one for sixes to wound in melee cause one mortal wound. Most of Zinch kind of wants to avoid melee like the plague with those bad invuls there, but I guess maybe could be okay on something like Screamers perhaps. And then another one that's got an unknown number of Warp Storm points, and that one gives you plus one ballistic skill across the entire army. I guess theoretically it could be quite fun if you're spamming a ton of horrors perhaps. Realistically though, I'm not sure quite how powerful that's going to be. I'd say Flamers might be looking like one of the most interesting ranged units that Zinch have. And of course, because they're auto-hitting, they won't care about extra ballistic skill. I'd say perhaps the most interesting thing might be those other universal ones. The minus one to hit is already pretty amazing. If there's a few nice generic damage amp up ones out of that as well, then it seems like that could be a real winner. Moving on, we've got a whole load of points values. These ones reportedly from the updated codex, that's the one that's going to be released. Again, I would probably take these with a pinch of salt, but honestly, some of these are a little bit higher than I was expecting. Blue horrors appear to be keeping the same at 7, but pink horrors go up a massive amount to 15. I guess I was expecting them to go up, seeing as they have a 4 plus chance to split into two blue horrors when they die, which does mean essentially they're already preloading themselves with other troops inside them. Still though, that's going to mean a horror squad's going to be 150 points, though it does sound like it would be an absolute pain to remove at range. Plague bearers are reportedly getting AP minus 2 melee, toughness 5 and 2 wounds, though for their troubles they are going from 9 points up to 15. It'll be interesting to see whether or not their big defensive buff outweighs that cost. Demonettes are reportedly going from 7 to 12, so plus 5 points there. Again, by the Warhammer community preview, they've got some pretty epic stat lines. 10 inch movement, AP minus 2, and a big 4 attacks in melee. I feel like on paper they're looking like one of the most appealing troops choices. It might be yet another good book for Slanesh maybe. Blood letters are reportedly 13 points, so plus 5 on the 8 currently. I think whether or not they're good is going to depend on how easy it is to get them into melee, and just how many easy damage buffs there are. With strength 5 and damage 2 attacks, they're on paper looking not too dissimilar to say Sisters of Battle Repentia. If they can be propelled to similar levels of easy charges and crazy damage dealing, then maybe they would have a role. They are potentially a fair bit tougher with those 4 plus saves against range. Next up, Flamers are 25, plus 5 points, and their warp fire did look a lot more interesting as well. Again, I feel like they could easily be a unit to watch. Fiends are reportedly down 5 to 35, Blood Crushers up 5 to 45, and we've got some more details on them in a second. Plague Drones are up 10 to 45, it did look like they'd gained massive amounts of damage and durability. The Beasts of Nurgle are all the way up to 80 points, which is pretty crazy, up a massive 45 points, though they have easily got well over twice as durable, so perhaps that isn't quite as unexpected as you might have guessed. At least that would mean that you get a semi-reasonable value of points out of the kit, which at the moment is perhaps one of the worst deals in terms of points for the amount of money that you spend on it. The Hellflare looks like it's down 5 to 75, the Seeker Chariot up 25 to 85, the Soul Grinder plus 30, and again getting just massively improved stats. The Lord of Change remains 300, Bellacor goes up to 420. Gaining that minus 1 damage at range really does make him look like he's going to be even more of a pain to remove. I think against a lot of targets, his durability went up by something like 60%, so having a 40 point bomb really doesn't seem like it's the end of the world. Otherwise, Keepers of Secrets are 280, Shalaxi Hellbane is 300, the Great Unclean One is 300, the Bloodthirsters are 310, a pretty massive plus 70 points bump. Hopefully they're actually somewhat worth it now. The Inferno Enrapturist is up 5 to 80, and more details on her later. And the Fecula Narmor remains 95 points unchanged. My bet is that people aren't going to react too well to these. Just on paper, you might say Wise Games Workshop putting up the points costs of units that aren't particularly strong right now. But I would bear in mind that they're getting just some mad extra abilities to go with this. I try and save any nerd rage until after the codex has come out, and we actually know the full abilities and the things that they can do. For all we know, every single demon unit could be more expensive, 
but that doesn't mean that it couldn't be the new strongest thing in 40k for all we know at the moment. Moving on, let's take a look at the gods individually. We'll start off with the Blood God. Mr. Trout on the Demons Discord did give us some details on Blood Crushers. They're going to be coming in that new Cornate Combat Patrol box, and they're rumoured to be 45 points, a big plus 5 from 40, and perhaps not really any major changes from what they've had before, besides just being a fair bit tougher and much more dangerous in melee. On their stat line, they've gained an extra 2 inch move to 10, which is quite nice as they were very slow for cavalry before, and much more defence in a plus 1 toughness, 2 toughness, 5, and a 4 plus demon invul at range and melee, so they're massively harder to kill than they were. Melee damage wise, it also seems like good news. 3 attacks each at strength 5, AP 3, and damage 2 on the Hellblade. Previously, their attacks were damage 1 and a bit underwhelming, plus an extra 4 on the charge from the Steed at strength 7, AP 2, and damage 1. In general, at least on paper compared with the Blood Letters, it looks like they won't be doing quite as much melee damage, but might be a fair bit tougher to take down with those 4 plus saves. Apparently, they've also got some sort of mortal wound on the charge stratagem for 1 CP. It sounds a little bit underwhelming from the wording that they gave. I'll wait to see the full text on that one. Hopefully they're good though. It doesn't hurt to have one of the things in the combat patrol box to be an actually usable competitive unit. Otherwise, here's a nice scattergun of things for corn. Apparently one wardle trait will allow you to ignore abilities that ignore wounds. Things like feel no pain and damage caps for Abaddon the Despoiler or Catan. Definitely a powerful ability, but just on its own for a whole warlord trait, it does seem a little bit niche. I guess if you really want to counter those specific models, it could be worth it. Skull Taker, we already got some details from, from Games Workshop themselves. He gets to re-roll hits and wounds versus characters, and has a command phase benefit to give Blood Letters a plus one to hit, plus most likely the Herald re-roll ones to wounds. In combat though, he's going to be striking with a big 6 attacks at strength 6, AP 3 and damage 3. He does seem to be pretty much ideally placed as a character killer. Karanak is a 3 headed Cerberus Flesh Hand of Death. He gets 6 attacks at strength 6, AP 2 and damage 2. He gets an aura of reroll ones to wound for nearby Flesh Hounds and he really is Korn's chief anti psycho doggo. If they're attacking Psychers, then nearby Flesh Hounds get full reroll wounds against those. He gets to deny 2 powers a turn. And if he wounds one set target that he's got, he gets to deal two mortal wounds instead of just his regular damage, so the enemy won't typically be getting saves. Quite a fun section of rules, I guess he might be kind of tempting if there's a lot of psychers about in the meta. Next there were two leak stratagems, it seems that each chaos god is going to get an icon stratagem for say if you've taken an icon of corn in your bloodletter unit, apparently the corn flavour of that will give you a 3d6 drop the lowest charge, so maybe not quite the full 3d6 flat out that the Banner of Blood was, but that's still a very handy boost. Will certainly give you a bit more chance of getting a deep strike charge off, but if the charge is a bit borderline anyway, it could well be worth triggering. The other thing that they confirmed was that that 4 plus deny the witch within 24 inches is back, and I do quite like the way that it turns into a 3 plus if there's flesh hands within that 24 inch range. That on its own seems like it could be quite a tempting reason to take flesh hands in the army, even if it wasn't mainly for their damage. They mentioned one relic for Korn, which is apparently kill an enemy model in melee to retain two warp storm points next turn. I kind of feel like if it's just to retain them that were unspent, it seems a bit rubbish. If it's to generate them outright, then that seems quite good. From the way it's worded here, it sounds like the former though. And finally, they did mention one ability for the Skull Altar. I'm sure that the Narmor it will probably have a few different helpful effects. It looked like it was confirmed to have that Warp Locust rule, allowing you to bring in some corn Demons quite close to enemies if they get near. But apparently there's going to be some sort of way for a character to embark on it, and then that character, maybe a Herald of corn, will be able to do an action where each unit in melee within 12 inches can generate you a Warp Storm point on the roll of a 4+. I really do quite like the imagery of it. I guess a Herald stands there while everyone's fighting nearby, and it gives corn loads of power. But in reality, it sounds like your opponent would have to move their way across the board and charge the corn demons. So it sounds like if they really want to prevent this, then it wouldn't really be too hard. Moving on to the decaying forces of Nurgle, we've got a trio of stratagems. Kind of similar to the Chaos Space Marine Codex, there's one for a basic transhuman physiology type rule. Normally one command point, though apparently two CP on bigger units of plague drones. Maybe it might be linked to the amount of power level of the unit or something, perhaps. There's another one command point one for a 4 plus chance to lock an enemy in combat, either with Beasts of Nurgle or Herticulus Slimux. Another pretty annoying one if you can tag some enemy units that don't really want to be in melee. And finally there's another 1 CP one which is the Nurgle Icon Stratagem, 
It does one mortal wound for every six to wound in melee for a unit. For unbuffed plague bearers, that would seem like it to be around two wounds or so. Doesn't seem super standout, unless there's things like ways for them to get extra attacks or reroll wound rolls. I guess maybe it could be better used on plague drones if they can take the same icon keyword. Everyone's favourite disturbing decaying jester, the sloppity bile piper, will give you a plus one to move, advance and charge, kind of similar to before. And apparently those jolly got pipes will give you some sort of way to counter enemy obsec. Often those abilities will be something like 3d6 versus leadership, and if the enemy fails it, then it means that they turn off their obsec. Seems like it could be okay in combination with plague bearers, depending on how feasible it is to buff them and the actual credible damage and defensive threats. I must admit with unit sizes locked to 10, I'm not enormously hopeful on that front. Finally, there's a few bits for feculent narmors. Games Workshop showed off that Shroud of Flies rule for a minus 1 to hit for Nurgle units that are less than 6 inches. Not a bad extra durability boost, plus the ability to regenerate some plague bearers. Apparently on top of that, it'll also be able to deal some mortal wounds. Supposedly if there's enemies in engagement range with it, then it deals some mortal wounds to them. And if it kills a model, then you gain one warp storm point, which is kind of fun. I guess anything that dies trying to attack it will very much feed the Garden of Nurgle. Slanesh next, and the leaks have yielded some decent info on a couple of the HQs. The Old Contorted Epitome and the Infernal Enrapturous, two of the more recent Slanesh offerings. The Epitome still moves very, very quickly at 12 inches, hits on 2s, strength 4, toughness 5, 8 attacks and wounds, and saves on a 4 both at ranged and melee. Kind of similar, and apparently it still has the 2 plus save against mortal wounds, that's just not going to be a credible way to kill it. Melee wise, it does seem like it's a fairly hefty proposition. The Demonet Attendants get 8 attacks with their claws, which are basically boosted version of Demonet Claws, it would seem, getting damage 2 rather than damage 1. Then the Writhing Coils of the Days itself get 5 attacks at strength 5, AP 2 and damage 3. So this thing does look like it will make quite a nasty mess of medium infantry, Space Marines aren't going to like it. Otherwise it casts 2 powers and denies 2, though it does seem to have lost its ability to prevent fallback. Instead of that option, it gains an interesting disruption ability. If the enemy starts the turn within 6 inches of it, you'd roll a 3d6 versus their leadership. If it's higher, then they halve their movement and get minus 1 to hit for the turn. It kind of does feel a little bit on the fluffy side that. Maybe they've got just too busy looking at themselves in the mirror, and they're not very able to concentrate on the serious business of fighting the demons. Next up is the Infernal Enrapturous. The Slanesh harp player with the unfortunate bloke who's been rather turned into a musical instrument. Certainly one of the creepier models that Games Workshop's made. Apparently they move just a little bit slower than standard demonettes at 9 inches. It's on 3s, strength and toughness 4, 4 attacks, 4 wounds, and a 5 plus slash 4 plus demon save. The melee also appears to be herald style claws, which get damage to over the base demonette ones. But this thing really does offer really quite a lot of benefits. First up, its range damage has got stronger, getting a strength 9, AP 3, and damage D3 plus 3 shot, so a significant power anti-tank shot there, or it can swap it out for 6 attacks at strength 5. Then it also gets the standard Herald reroll ones to wound aura, apparently has an ability to resurrect D3 demonettes or one seeker per command phase, and still has that anti psyker denial thing that enemy psychers still perils on any double when they're within 24 inches. Previously, I did think that the Infernal Enrapturist was perhaps one of the worst HQ choices for the demons. This seems to be far, far better though. A more powerful shooting attack, two very easy direct buffs, as well as keeping that anti psyker disruption. Doesn't seem to be too bad for 80 points in my opinion. Otherwise, a few more bits and bobs for Slanesh. There's two stratagems shown off. A 1 CP1 for Slanesh units not to be hit on a 1 to 3 in melee. Basically transhuman to hit. That's will really make a mess of attacks from things like commanders or custodies. There's a 1 CP1 for a Slanesh icon unit to get 4 rerolls to hit. If that's true, then that's a very easy direct damage buff to demonette units. That one seems likely to be well worth using a lot of times that they fight. I guess it might seem a little bit less efficient if the icon costs a lot though. They've got that warlord trait that I think may have been leaked on Warhammer Community. A way to store warp storm points, 2 per battle round if you haven't spent them. That could be some insurance against rolling high or rolling low on different turns. The popular Slanesh Relic, the Forbidden Gem, was one that you could use to turn off characters for in a fight phase once per game. Unfortunately, that Relic has been shifted a bit. Now you use it to pick a unit in the command phase, and that unit can't use auras. I guess the range of that might really matter as to how easy that is to deploy. 
If it's too short, then it might not be all that relevant until the character bearing it is kind of overwhelmed and dead. Finally, there's a few fun bits for Celesque. That's the fun Demon Prince and Herald combo. They now grant auras for rerolls of one to hit and to wound. And actually, it seems like their melee attacks have actually maybe got a little bit on the weaker side. They only get six attacks with strength seven, AP three, and damage three. Then another six from the Herald with strength four, AP two, and damage one. And then six shots with their whip at strength four, AP two, and damage one. Broadly, that is less damage than it was before. Though currently, it is a very expensive model at 230 points. I wouldn't be massively surprised if it went down a bit in cost or had other interesting abilities. In any case, though, three sets of sixes should certainly please Slanesh. Finally, we've got the ever-changing forces of Zinch. First up, some news for Horrors, which we saw Games Workshop's preview for. They confirmed that they'll be hitting on threes at base now, and getting a truly massive 3 plus demon save at range, meaning that they're going to be spectacularly hard to shift when shooting, but rather easy to kill in combat with only their six up to protect them. As mentioned before, apparently they're going to be 15 points each for the pinks, though GW said that they split on a 4 plus when dying, so basically you're going to average one blue horror per pink horror that was on the board, making them a very durable unit overall, particularly with that 3+. plus. I think perhaps the thing that I was most interested in for them was how good their shooting was going to be. For a 15 point model it doesn't seem super overwhelming though. Assault 2, Strength 4, AP-1 and Damage 1. At 15 points it does look like the horrors might be paying a big premium for their durability. Then if you feel blues they're going to be rumoured to be 7 points. Their attacks are only going to be at Strength 3 and they only have a 4 plus invul against range. Then Brimstones, which I'd guess are going to be 5 points if you can still fill them individually whatsoever. They get 2 shots at strength 2, and only the 5 plus invul at range. Kind of seemed like a weird unit. Even with buffs, I'd be kind of surprised if they amounted to any sort of crazy damage dealers. But between the 3 plus demon save, plus splitting, it could be a properly annoying unit to kill. Just depends on whether or not that's worth paying 150 points for a unit of them though. The blues and the brimstones might take on even more value if you do want to fill troop slots. Finally, there's a whole bunch of details for Zinch in general. In particular, rather a lot of stuff for the various flavours of Herald. The Fate Skimmer is kind of the Herald of Zinch on a chariot. I'm sure they'll have a fairly similar profile to the Burning Chariot and also some Psychic, but apparently one of their buffs is going to be giving sixes to hit auto wound for Screamers, so quite a fun little synergy with those bitey blue discs for them. The Fluxmaster is the Herald on the disc. He will give it a buff of sixes to hit auto wound for horrors when shooting. That doesn't seem bad, again, particularly if combined with the Herald reroll of ones. More weirdly, though, apparently the Changecaster gives a buff of auto wounding sixes to hit in melee for horrors, which does seem a bit weird as they want to avoid melee like the plague. Otherwise, apparently the Changeling isn't really also very different. They get to copy an infantry stat line in melee and get fairly tough to kill in combat as well, with 5 wounds and toughness 5, though apparently they've lost the 6 plus feel no pain aura. Hopefully, it's replaced by something useful. Otherwise, the blue scribes can still auto-cast spells somehow, though they didn't say how. One fun zinch stratagem that was mentioned was a one command point to teleport a character to anywhere on the board. It's just one CP to do so for a herald, and two CP to do so for something different, like a lord of change. Potentially that could be some quite fun movement shenanigans there, particularly with the powerful zinch psychic powers, which sound like they could be dealing a whole bunch of mortal wounds. Then they talked about three zinch relics. One that's a buff to a combat weapon with a plus one damage and extra mortal wounds on sixes. Supposedly that could go on any combat weapon, so it's probably going to be best suited on a Lord of Change, I suppose. The Impossible Robe is no longer a three plus inball save. I guess they get that at range anyway now, but that one allows you to ignore the first failed save each turn. On a Lord of Change with a three plus and the potential to command point reroll as well, that does seem like he'd be spectacularly annoying to remove. I don't think it's going to be quite enough to really make them top in combat though. Finally, there's one for any unmodified cast of a 9+, plus is undeniable. Again, maybe not super, super solid on its own. Cast of 9+, plus on the first place are going to be quite hard to deny, so I think that that's maybe slightly questionable value. Supposedly, and maybe a little bit depressingly, according to the leakers, Zinch is looking like the weakest option of the Chaos Gods in the book. I guess being super weak in combat just isn't particularly helpful in 9th edition. Unless you're playing Tau or something, the vast majority of armies will be packing at least some solid melee. So anyway, there we have a preview of rather a lot of Chaos Demons leaks. As always, a big thank you to the folks who have been providing us with those. Really quite cool to have extra details about the Codex. 
and I suppose we don't have all that long to wait until we get more details of it from official sources. Looking forward to hearing what your thoughts are down in the comments below. Obviously we still only have a partial picture at the moment, but how strong do you think the demons are going to be shaping up to be? Will the forces of the warp run roughshod over the current armies of the 41st millennium? Or are all those demon involves and warp storm points just not really worth as much as they're cracked up to be? As I mentioned, feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics if you'd like to see the full Demons Codex review. Looking forward to properly taking a look through the book's rules. Hopefully that should be out sometime Sunday to Monday. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention Allspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and that's the main reason that I can afford to spend quite so much time and effort making videos about Warhammer 40k things. If you have been enjoying the videos on the channel quite a bit, any support is enormously appreciated. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.